Welcome to another Foss North. I would like to start by thanking our gold sponsors, our silver sponsors, our base sponsors, and our partners from the community. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, we have Christo with us. So welcome, Christo. Hi. Aurelien, nice to meet you all. Today we're going to talk about blockchain and the future of finance. Let me share you my presentation. Perfect. Okay. Some words about me. Uh, my name is Chris Tupev. I'm a software developer and innovations manager. For the last seven, eight years, I've been working as a technology consultant for asset management, electronic trading, and blockchain companies. And I also run the team of Motion Software, which is an organization of people who also work on that kind of projects. So today's topic is the future of finance is decentralization. And this lecture will be a quick dive into the world of DeFi. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. That's exactly what we're going to explain right now. Uh, what's our agenda? We're going to talk about how blockchain is changing the world and why that's important how wallets, smart contracts, and decentralized applications work, what's the meaning of the term DeFi, popular applications of DeFi, risks associated with this technology, and how to be part of that industry and area of science. So, uh, this picture visualizes a blockchain, which is most of you know is a big network of computers who execute the same operations and share the same memory all the time. Um, Bitcoin was the first project uh, that created the biggest and still the most uh, powerful blockchain in the world. And then it was followed by Ethereum. Ethereum introduced the concept of smart contracts and executionable codes on the blockchain, while Bitcoin was just about transactions and sending money or equivalent of money from one peer of the network to another. Uh, I mentioned Ethereum because most um, of the things that we're going to talk about today are projects based on the Ethereum blockchain and they exist thanks to this technology and thanks to this network of computers processing not just transactions, but also the centralized applications. How blockchain is changing the world? Uh, actually, the blockchain technology is introducing a new system of money. Um, the new system, it's not completely, completely different from the old system, but it has few unique features that the old system could not provide. The first unique feature is that there is no centralized control. What it means, all accounts, just imagine like your bank account, for example, um, they are not held by any institution or any individual, everything stays on this shared memory, uh, which is shared between hundreds or thousands or sometimes even millions of computers. 
So no one can simply delete your account or no one can modify the balance of your account without being in consensus with all the computers on the system. If you guys have any questions, now is the time to uh, tell you to, to ask them on the YouTube channel next to the video. I will be answering them um, in real time. <laughs> no need to wait uh, for the end of this presentation. The second feature of the blockchain financial system is that uh, there is no limitation of access. Basically, if you have any digital assets or data stored on the blockchain, you can access it 24 seven. There are no holidays, there are no bank days and bank holidays as it uh, typically happens when you try to uh, make a transaction with your local bank on uh, Sunday and you should wait for another day to do that. Uh, a third good feature is um, when you want to do any kind of trades or other financial operations, um, <clears throat> there are no people in between. That means that you do the trade directly um, with your counterparty. You trade directly with the people that want to purchase your goods or your services, and you don't need to wait for another party to react or for another party to confirm a transaction. Thus, the blockchain removes the inefficiencies in the current system. Opacity. Uh, this is the fourth unique feature of this uh, new way of controlling money. Uh, basically, on the blockchain, everything is visible. You can trace every transaction. You can check the balance of every wallet. And um, anyone on the system can verify the origin of the assets that reside in a given wallet, uh, which is an amazing feature that the current financial system is achieving to uh, hundreds of um, institutions, um, agencies that check uh, taxation reports, uh, agencies that do surveillance on the assets of the people and their accounts across different jurisdictions and so on. Uh, on the blockchain system that comes out of the box, so we don't need all these uh, heavy agencies. <clears throat> and the last but not least, um, you don't need a customer support because everything um, that happens there <clears throat> is designed in such a way that it cannot break and it shouldn't break. Uh, in the past, there were some uh, cases when blockchains and more specifically the Ethereum blockchain was hacked, uh, but this event was mitigated. The blockchain was fixed. It split actually into uh, a new chain and the old one is still there, it's called Ethereum Classic. The new one is the main Ethereum chain uh, that happened probably five years ago or six years ago. And since then there were no problems with uh, the Ethereum blockchain. So we believe that the system is secure enough as uh, the time shows that uh, it's durable to all known attacks so far. I see there is a question from Cardano Bulgaria. 
Please elaborate on the way collateral in case of loans is managed in cases when collateral is not crypto. Sure, I'll talk about that a little bit later. So stay, <laughs> stay on the presentation for another 15 minutes. Uh, how to use any blockchain. So in order to get on that system and start making transactions or save your data there, uh, you need one simple thing. It's called a wallet. Um, simply said, wallet is just these two numbers, these two strings. So you have your address, also known as the public key. This is the blue number. And you also have your private key. The address is um, something which is public. I will demonstrate how this wallet looks like. Uh, just a second. Yeah. <clears throat> so I could, as you can see, here is my wallet and I have zero dollars in it. Uh, and if I had any money, I would see my balance here and I would see all the transactions that happened until that balance. I will show you such example as well. I have one bigger wallet here. So inside this wallet, you can see that there is more than $1 million uh, that are spread across different digital assets. So here we have Sushi Swap token, we have uh, Mstable token, Uniswap, and so on. This information is all public. This website, DBank, is just one of the many websites that uh, display information fetched from the blockchain from the Ethereum blockchain system. And anyone can fetch such information uh, to the public API of Ethereum. Uh, here you can also see all the transactions that happened uh, between this wallet and other wallets. So the first step is to create such wallet. Um, as you may heard there are many kinds of wallets uh software wallets let me open this again so there are software wallets web wallets cold wallets and hardware wallets uh, the main mechanism behind all these is the same all of them pretty much keep your private key safe the one below because once you have this private key you are capable of making transactions and sending money from your wallet to other wallets or smart contracts uh, that we talk about later. So uh, a software wallet is a program on your computer that holds this key securely and we hope that the hackers will not reach to this program to steal your private key. A web wallet is very similar, uh, but the program is not on your computer, it's on the cloud, and you can access it from anywhere. Cold wallet. Um, cold wallet typically means that you have written down your private key on a piece of paper, as you can see on this picture, or you have saved it on a external flash drive. So you can open it only when you plug your flash drive into your computer. And there is also the so-called hardware wallet. It works similarly to the cold wallet on a flash drive, but the hardware wallet is a piece of hardware that has additional software that protects your private key. 
and you can uh, access it by putting down a key, a password on your hardware wallet. Um, so in order to start with uh, blockchain and like having money, having assets there, making any kind of operation there, you can start by MetaMask. This is the most common and powerful wallet. It's a Google Chrome extension that anyone can install for free and start receiving or sending digital money. Uh, what are small, smart contracts? I already mentioned this term. So uh, for the people who are familiar with programming, and in particular object-oriented programming, you know, the classes, the classes are the building blocks of all programs. Uh, smart contracts are the classes of the blockchain programs. So by writing and deploying smart contracts to the blockchain, um, we can deploy logic um, and applications similarly to the applications that you can access from the app store of your phone. Um, these are the difference between the applications on your phone and the applications that turn on the blockchain is that uh, the blockchain applications are executed by all nodes, by all computers in that system, which makes them secure and uh, immutable, although it makes them very slow and very expensive to execute, as you need to run them to the CPUs or virtual processors, like uh, graphical processors of all these computers. What's the meaning of the term DeFi? Decentralized finance, this is the abbreviation, is a system by which financial products become available as decentralized applications, also known as dApps, making them open to anyone to use rather than going to middlemen like banks or brokerages. <clears throat> so, um, the blockchain system could be also used for other applications, not just financial ones. A good example are the super trendy NFTs, which um, represent a proof that you own a piece of art or a piece of information. NFTs could be considered as DeFi, but sometimes they could be used for uh, games or for other uh, purposes also, that also involve blockchain but are not part of the decentralized finance. Uh, I'm saying that because sometimes people think that uh, the blockchain technology is all about money, all about transactions uh, and uh, finance. Actually, it could be used for many other uh, purposes. How the decentralized finance is different from the traditional one. So with the traditional financial system, we have a bank or we have other kind of financial institution like a hedge fund, uh, like uh, electronic uh, app, like mobile application like Revolut, for example, which is not completely a bank, but offers financial products. Um, and these products could be checking and saving accounts, they could be borrowing and lending products. So you take money, uh, you borrow money from the bank when you need. Um, could be insurances, could be taxation and accounting services. In the DeFi world, we have all these products, but they're not run by a central unit they run on the blockchain. And the most interesting thing is that these products, they are not run by people, but they are programs. So basically, um, when you want to borrow money, you don't borrow the money from a guy that has a key to a vault for money. 
you borrow the money from a program who stores other people's money again in a programmatic way. Uh, currently, there are about $60 billion uh, stored in the DeFi economy. And all these money are spread across multiple protocols that we are going to talk about in a minute. This screenshot is from a website called DeFi Pools, and it's a very good source of information about all the protocols, protocols and projects. Uh, in the field. <clears throat> Here, some of the most popular projects. We have MakerDAO. MakerDAO is also the first uh, DeFi project. It's the first project that allows its users to borrow money from a smart contract. Uh, we have Compound, DYDX, Aave, and many others. Uh, they provide different financial services that we are going to discuss right now. Uh, actually, the ecosystem is very rich and huge. As you can see, all these logos, they represent companies who produce open source software uh, on the blockchain. And each of these company some of them are even not companies, but teams or just uh, sole developers. Each of them focus on different um, applications of um, the DeFi technology. Some of them develop the so-called stable coins. These are digital assets that are packed to real currencies like the US dollar. The most common example is the DAI token, the USDC coin, uh, and so on. There are services that enable other projects to interact with the blockchain in a more effective way. There are infrastructure and dev tools, asset management tools, and exchanges. I'm not going to talk about each of them because that will take weeks <laughs> so let's see some of the brightest examples so one of the key applications um, of DeFi is trading so how trading happens there on the left hand side here you can see a traditional order book um, this is an image that you can find on all traditional exchanges, uh, starting from the New York Stock Exchange, for example, uh, NASDAQ, uh, and then going to the more uh, modern crypto exchanges like uh, Bittrex, Binance, and so on. And um, in this particular way of trading, we have the orders of, on the left side of all people that want to buy given a uh, product or currency. And on the right side, we have the orders of all the people that sell it. And a trade happens when there is a match uh, in the pricing between the supply and the demand. So in the decentralized finance exchanges, the trading happens differently. We don't have other books there. We have something called automated market maker. You can see that on the right side. And the automated market maker, this is a smart contract that holds assets on both sides of a trading pair and continuously quotes a price for buying and for selling. Uh, so if I want to buy Ethereum, for example, uh, with my DAI tokens, I can simply send my DAI tokens to the smart contract and the smart contract will send me back Ethereum tokens from a pool of assets which is already staked inside the smart contract. 
The smart contract can also take into account more complex data than uh, just beat and ask, but also um, other information regarding the price of the asset. We'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that as well. Uh, since smart contracts are isolated from the outer world, they need a way to receive information about pricing as um, people trade such assets on many other places. So the price could be quite volatile. And um, we use something called oracles in order to uh, take information from the outer world inside the blockchain. Uh, oracles are simply methods in the code that can receive information uh, from other services, other APIs, and so on. <clears throat> you ask how the money gets into these smart contracts so people can trade them. The answer is liquidity providers. Liquidity providers are people who stake money and generate fees uh, so other people can trade. This also became a very trendy field called yield mining <clears throat> for people who want to make profits uh, by holding digital assets. So, on one side we have a guy who wants to buy and sell, and on the other side we have a guy who provides both assets. Typically, the liquidity provider provides equal amounts of both assets to the smart contract, so uh, there is enough from both to uh, for the peoples to trade. Uh, in exchange of that, the liquidity provider gets um, interest, so she earns money out of the out of the transactions of the other people. The people, the traders who trade, they um, pay a little fee every time when they execute a trade, and this fee converts into an interest for the liquidity provider. I can show you now how that works on Uniswap. Uniswap is the most popular DeFi exchange. And on this page, you can see all possible trading pairs. So for example, we have here Ethereum, USDT. These are pretty much two out of five, the most popular digital assets out there. So, if I want to buy Ethereum with dollar, US dollar Tether, I can simply click here, go trade, connect my wallet, and exchange uh, my hundred dollars for Ethereum. And <clears throat> here you can see there is a fee, zero point twenty-two percent. This fee will accumulate and will go to the liquidity providers. At the end, the liquidity providers can generate an annual percentage, an annual fee of 30% for providing money to this smart contract. So if I want to become a liquidity provider, I can again click on the pair, click on add liquidity, and stake for my Ethereum wallet uh, an equal amount of US dollars and Ethereum. You can see even when I type the amount of dollars that I'd like to stake, automatically the amount of Ethereum is presented to me. So if I stake 10,000 USDCs, which is equal to $10,000, and for Ethereums, um, I will start making profit on this deposit. And the profit, just a second, USDC. 
bleach because he disappeared. The profit will be 38% per year. Uh, and it will be paid back again in these two tokens. Excuse me for uh, <clears throat> the confusion because when I click on that liquidity, oh, now it's USDT. That's the right pair, not USDC. Again, if I stake 10,000 USDTs, I should also stake for Ethereum. And um, this interest, it will be paid, I think, every minute on Uniswap. So even if I stake um, money just for a day, I will also generate returns and it will be this percentage divided by uh, the numbers of the number of the days in the year. Uh, and um, <clears throat> these liquidity fees, they depend, of course, on the volume, meaning how many people how, how much money people trade for the last seven days on this smart contract and the liquidity, basically how much money are inside these smart contracts. As higher the liquidity and as lower the volume, as lower the interest. That's logical, I think. Um, other popular exchanges like Uniswap, uh, uh, quick swap, banker, pancake swap, and uh, so on. There are many now because many people saw that as a uh, good way to trade and also a good way to make profit on their money. I see there is a new question from Ivan. I'll answer the questions of Cardano Bulgaria a little bit later when we reach the section for nodes. Uh, Ivan asks, is it locked the amount that you deposit or you can withdraw anytime? Yeah, you can withdraw your money from the smart contract anytime uh, and it's not locked for, let's say, seven days, one year and so on. So it's very, very flexible system. Landing. Here we reach that point. That's another application of the DeFi economy. Um, so we discussed how trading work. Let's see now how lending can happen in this digital environment. Um, I took these screenshots from a very comprehensive tutorial that will be shared after the lecture and you can learn more about it because it's not uh, super simple but also it's not unreasonably hard to understand. Um, <clears throat> here we talk about MakerDAO, the first, as I said, uh, active DeFi application. Uh, and from MakerDAO, you can do the so-called collateralized loans. Um, what does collateral mean? Uh, it's very simple. For example, when you want to get a credit from the, your bank, you stake your apartment or you stake your car or you leave something as collateral. Uh, the collateral is an asset which the bank can take over in case you don't pay back your money. We have absolutely the same concepts uh, on DeFi. So in MakerDAO, if I want to uh, <clears throat> borrow money, I can leave my Ethereum as collateral. So in this example, in step one, I want to deposit my Ethereum to make it out. I deposit 150. I deposit one Ethereum, which at the time of speaking costs 150 US dollars. And MakerDAO is uh, giving me back 100 USD dollars uh, under the form of DAI tokens, 
one die token is also one dollar. It's a stable coin. Uh, so I have debt of hundred dollars, and I have my hundred and fifty dollars uh, used as collateral inside the MakerDAO smart contract. It's all smart contracts. So for me, the terms and conditions of this credit and these transactions are super clear because they're open source. I can read them. Uh, so now I have a hundred dollars that I can use to purchase anything else. And I also have my Ethereum uh, and I make profit on potential price spikes of the Ethereum. How would you guys spend this hundred dollars? Until you think about a question, I will use the time to answer the second question of Cardano Bulgaria. Why should I get a DeFi loan if I need to back it up 100% in currency? I could go to the traditional bank instead. Uh, <laughs> you should go, you can go, of course, but the traditional bank will give you uh, higher interest and way, way higher administration. Because when you go on DeFi, nobody asks you about your ID, nobody asks you about your credit history. You simply take your collateral and you get the other asset. Um, so there is no middleman and thus the whole system is way more effective and way more cheaper in terms of fees. And for your other question, uh, how does it work when collateral is not in crypto? Um, <clears throat> that's very, very good question, actually, because digitalizing uh, physical assets is one of the main fields uh, of interest and uh, very like hot domain how that can happen. Uh, currently, the only way to happen is you need, again, a trusted party that can value your asset and then the price of your asset could be propagated to the smart contract by Oracle. Uh, we're going to talk about derivatives and that kind of assets in a bit, so stay tuned for that. How do you buy a car then? Of course, when I take this hundred dollars in die, I can sell them for a real hundred dollars and buy the car. So I will have the car and I will have my Ethereum staked on the blockchain. <clears throat> Vesely, DeFi operates within areas that traditionally have significant oversight from governments and regulatory bodies around the world. Do you foresee any regulatory risks surrounding DeFi? Yes, of course, there are risks. Um, the good thing is that even regulation, like better regulation for DeFi happens uh, in terms of uh, a given government, given state makes DeFi illegal. Uh, it will be very, very hard for the state to chase uh, and to detect the usage of DeFi because everyone connected on the internet can be part of DeFi. Um, so, in order to stop DeFi, they need to stop the internet. Uh, and yeah, there are countries that managed to do that, uh, but not entirely. <laughs> yes, Cardano Bulgaria, you cannot uh, stake real assets without a third party custodian at the moment, unfortunately. So, once I have my hundred dollars back. So, once I have. Okay, uh, there was a little disruption. Um, once I have my hundred dice back, I can send them to the contract. Uh, it's called the Maker CDB contract. And 
it will automatically release my Ethereum back to my Ethereum wallet, the same wallet that I use to send my Ethereum token. And this is a good uh, example of how DeFi lending works. There is one more type of lending, which is very, very interesting. It's a very trendy topic. It's called the flash loan. Uh, using flash loans, you can borrow huge amounts of digital assets without collateral. And uh, people will ask, what's the catch? The catch is that you can use this money within the same transaction. Uh, that means that you actually don't really borrow the money. You just prove that they're accessible in a given wallet. And you need to keep that in that wallet uh, for your transaction, like at the end of the transaction. So you cannot basically spend the money or buy something with that money that will be granted to another uh, beneficiary. And it's used in a more technical um, cases uh, of the blockchain trading. For example, people make arbitrage with flash loans. Um, Flash loans can be also used for hacks, and some smart contracts were hacked by flash loans. So people should be aware of the technology and also know how to protect from it <laughs> if they develop smart contracts. Uh, popular lending decentralized applications are MakerDAO, Aave, and Compound. Uh, Avent Compound, they work similarly to MakerDAO. They provide uh, more pairs that you can uh, lend from, uh, borrow from. And they also provide sometimes better interest rates because uh, in order to borrow Ethereum, for example, from a smart contract, again, you need a liquidity provider. So if you have spare Ethereum or spare anything, you can stake it in one of these protocols and again start making interest while other people use this money to borrow them. <coughs> uh, here it comes a third uh, application of DeFi, um, derivatives. That's something very interesting. And it's something that um, is the, pretty much the hottest topic in the industry for the moment. Uh, I will focus on stocks and commodities. Um, although a derivative is a financial security with a value that is reliant upon or derived from an underlying asset or group of assets. So we can also have market indices, we can have bonds, these are like governmental bonds, uh, we can have interest rates and so on as derivatives. Um, <clears throat> very recently, the biggest crypto exchange, Binance, uh, released stock tokens. So these are um, crypto derivatives that are packed to uh, the stock prices of Apple, of Coinbase, Microsoft, Tesla, MicroStrategy, and so on. Um, and this is a very good example of how non-crypto assets could become crypto assets, or at least how we can bet on the price of non-crypto assets by using crypto. Although this uh, exchange is not really DeFi, as Binance is centralized uh, company and centralized crypto exchange. Uh, so I'm showing you here another example of truly decentralized exchange that offers similar products, and this is Synthetics. So on Synthetics, you can now uh, <clears throat> trade commodities 
Currently, they have silver, gold, and oil as commodities. And they use, again, the uh, information about the price comes from a trusted party. Um, they're probably connected to one of the leading exchanges or uh, stock exchange information providers like Bloomberg, for example. Um, and again, you use crypto. Also, these uh, products here, they're smart contracts. So you use, you use crypto to trade commodities through smart contracts. Uh, and you don't have a middleman that can intercept or sniff your activity. Cool. So we went to three of the popular applications of DeFi. And now uh, I want also to discuss some of the risks associated with these technologies, with this technology. Uh, the first risk that arises from the usage of uh, smart contracts is called the smart contract risk. So that's a logical error in the code of the smart contract or economic exploit in which an attacker can withdraw funds from the contract or from a protocol beyond the intended functionality. Over the past decade, uh, that happened a few times. Um, these hacks, they typically happen because of poor security practices. Uh, and um, that's just an, an, another demonstration of how uh, vulnerable are uh, bad managed projects and uh, you know code that's not written very well to malpractice. Uh, smart contracts can also hinder the risk of a logical error, which means that the developer haven't um, seen, like haven't foreseen a logic that um, <coughs> a logic that can execute, but it's still there. Custodial risk. Um, so, as we discussed, the different wallets, they're also associated with the different ways of custody. We have uh, self-custody, partially self-custody, and third-party custody. Self-custody is when we hold our money and we are never insured from bad people simply coming to us and uh, taking our wallet, asking us about our private keys and so on. We have a uh, partial custodian, uh, partial custody. This is probably the most secure way because we have part of the key, another third party organization has the other part and only together we can execute transaction. So the bad people should influence both parties. And the third party custody is when our private keys stay within another organization and the third party organization can take our money without asking us if they decide. We have scaling risks. So the Ethereum blockchain is limited to a low number of transactions at high cost. Uh, currently on the Ethereum blockchain, we can do about uh, 15 transactions per second. Uh, which compared to, let's say, the Visa system uh, is quite low. On Visa system, you can do about 65,000 transactions per second. <clears throat> uh, and if we experience high load on our smart contracts, uh, they might not work uh, as um, planned or simply some of the transactions could not be processed or they will be processed at very, very high price. Because on the Ethereum blockchain, you pay with Ethereum for every transaction that you do. Um, <clears throat> although 
the Ethereum team is constantly working on improving that. And uh, there is a new version of Ethereum coming out, uh, which is expected to sort out many of these issues. So I would, I don't worry that much about the scaling risks associated with DeFi. And there is one more risk called the impermanent loss. It's not fundamental to smart contracts because impermanent loss happens only with automated market makers. These are the smart contracts that I showed you that people use to trade. Uh, and the risk here is that you can lose from um, not keeping your crypto assets outside the contract because when you stake an asset in an auto out to a pair when you stake a pair of assets into an automated market maker um, your assets are basically um, <coughs> packed one to the other so even if let's say you have Ethereum and USDC, uh, if you if the Ethereum dramatically jumps, uh, spikes in terms of uh, price, you can lose uh, because your Ethereum is still connected to the door, and at the end, um, you with all less Ethereum that you staked, although you made a fee. Um, by providing liquidity. This loss is called impermanent because it can be recovered if the price reverts to the original level of the underlying token. All right, so I hope that was interesting. Um, here are some advices on how to be part of DeFi. So you can learn more about blockchain and DeFi. Uh, from many, many sources. Nowadays, there are even uh, courses in academia, in the university about, in the universities about blockchain and so on. I will also publish a list of uh, resources on LinkedIn and on my FOSNOT uh, page that you can download. You can meet people who work on DeFi projects. It's a community-based network. As the previous speaker said, the open source uh, world, it's all about community. So the stronger in the community are also the stronger in the technology. So be part of the community. Don't uh, freak out when talking to people about what you love and what you do. Uh, learn how to develop smart contracts. That's an essential skill. Even if you don't actively develop them, you need at least to understand how they work and to be able to read them. Uh, invent and deploy new token economics and protocols. Uh, so smart contracts are just the building blocks, but the interaction between them is uh, sometimes often called token economics. Um, and uh, people need to be creative and uh, smart in order to invent new DeFi products or new blockchain applications. So uh, that's a very, very good skill to have. Okay, here are the references. Uh, I used lots of materials that I found on the internet and also there is very, very nice research on DeFi and the future of finance by Harvey, Rahman, Dran and Santoro and I really suggest uh, taking a look at it. It's available for free as well. Uh, I see there is another question. What's your opinion on the future of NFT? Very good question. Um, NFTs allow people to create identifiable uh, piece of information <laughs> for their physical assets uh, or to create uh, 
basically to lock a piece of art into a token. Uh, the difference between NFTs and um, the tokens that we use to trade uh, is that NFTs are non-fungible tokens, meaning that they're unique. So, as you know, we have so many uh, other coins like Cardano, like Polkadot, like Ethereum. Basically, by creating a new NFT, you create your own coin, which is unique. And I believe that uh, one day we'll use NFTs to identify uh, unique things that could be a piece of art, it could be uh, a unique car, a unique uh, song or something like that. Uh, in very efficient way, again, without going to intermediaries. So one day, for example, music, they can, I think they already can do that. Uh, like musicians can release their songs without having uh, managers and without having um, all these um, intermediary industry that's taking half of the profits at least. All right. Thank you very much. It's been a very interesting session. <laughs> thank you, Juan. Yeah, thank you, Christo. So, so we are slowly running out of time for, for setting mm -hmm. up the next speaker. Uh, but I'd like to thank you very much for, for joining in. And thanks to everyone who asked questions. And, and we will be back in a couple of minutes.